Hello, today we are going to have a virtual coffee with uh, Mei An Chen. For those of you who don't know her, Mei An Chen is an orchestral conductor, really good orchestral conductor. Mei An, I'm really, really, really happy to have you here today. I know we yes. will have a lot of fun. And uh, so just to explain uh, to people, uh, I do this series of a coffee with because I, 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 I want people to, to get to know the artists. And my intention is to, to speak about music in a way that is not uh, elitist. I mean, people have conversations of, about a lot of things and music is another topic. It's not just classical music, it's music as a, as a whole. I have to say, uh, I don't know Mei An Chen in person. I got to know Mei An uh, because of a very good friend of mine, the violinist Mikhail Puchekin, told me about Mei An Chen. Uh, he played um, some years ago the Mendelssohn Concerto for Violin with you in, uh, in Basel, with the Basel Symphony Orchestra. So that's why I got to know about you. And then I started researching and finding out about, about things about you. But since I want this coffee to be a discovery for everybody, I want this also. I want this to be a discovery for me. So that's my intention. Let's discover who Mei An Chen is. Welcome, Mei An. Thank you, Michael, and and thank you for having me on the show. And if, before we go on, I actually have double playing. If you don't mind me signing on back on. It, it's, okay, uh, no problem. Let's, yeah. let, let's do it. Because, okay, yeah. let me try it. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you okay, can that's, me? that's much better now. Thank you. Thank you for letting me reset that. Okay, no problem. Okay, let's cross fingers. Let's hope it works. <laughs> yep. Right. I was saying that... Mm, I'd like people to, to get to, to discover who you are. Uh, you were born in 1973 in Taiwan. And for me, it's a kind of mystery for someone who's been born in Taiwan, in the United States, all, all over the world, playing with symphony orchestras. So uh, how did you start in music and why? Yes, uh, I grew up in a household um, that... My parents love music and never had the chance since they grew up um, under the Japanese occupation in Taiwan. So their dream was to give their two daughters something they could not have. So I uh, ended up playing the piano at seven, my sister is seven and a half. But my sister really wanted to be a visual artist instead of a performing artist. Uh, she likes to paint uh, Chinese painting in her own time, in her own space. So I ended up the double duty of entertaining my parents on the violin and the piano. So Great. that's how so, I begin. Yeah. And your parents weren't musicians. No, but if my mother could have training, she's definitely going to be a diva, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, when did, it, uh, did you get that um, feeling for uh, conducting? Because I know you started learning piano, violin, and at a certain time also trumpet. Is that true? Yeah, I was self-taught on trumpet. So let me start... You know, the piano and violin are fun, but uh, when I play in the orchestra for the first time at age 10, um, I was a rather quiet child. But when I saw this person on the podium to help create the biggest sound, I ran home and told my parents, violin and piano are fun, but I want, really want to be, I really want to play the biggest instrument in the room, which is being a conductor. And they frowned and looked very worried. They said, we don't know where to find your teachers. And so I took the matter into my own hand. I would memorize my violin part and fix my eyes on the conductor. I thought I could learn by observation. Teacher. Mm -hmm. And so there I was um, in terms of just learning on my own since age 10 mm -hmm. and was determined that being a conductor was, was what I wanted to do for life. Mm -hmm. And um, you started uh, learning how to conduct 
in Taiwan? Uh, well, let me put it this way. You know, I had a, I was very fortunate to have Henry Major, who was um, associate conductor with the Chicago Symphony under Fritz Reiner. I don't know why, but he chose Taiwan to be his place to develop his career. So I play under him as a high school uh -huh. uh, violinist, and he, actually he gave me many recordings to broaden my horizon, you know, chamber music. I've yeah. never really known chamber music. So he gave me recordings of um, Smetana Quartet um, at the Dvorak, and he gave me my first score, which is a, a conductor score to Brook right. Violin Concerto. And so uh, th I was uh -huh. going to be in academic um, setting in Taiwan in terms of uh, my parents' dreams yeah. um, of being me, uh, of having me become a concert violinist was not going to happen. You either study abroad or, uh -huh. um, or you stay in Taiwan very interested in earth science, uh, geology, and I thought, okay, no, mm -hmm. I was going to do nothing uh, as a profession for music until um, Benjamin Zender from Boston took the Youth Philharmonic from New England Conservatory that were on tour to Taiwan and Korea. Uh, in 18, uh, sorry, 1989. I was, I was a teenager, and uh, my I went to the concert, her Bartok Concerto for Orchestra for the first time. And it was quite funny, you know, half of the orchestra was uh, was falling asleep in the concert. They were having jet lag. They just got off the plane from America. And um, my older accompanist took me backstage to ask, to meet him and to ask him, do you have time to listen to this little girl play the violin next day before you leave town? And he said, yeah, come, 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 come to our hotel. So I show up at the hotel. Um, they already check out heading to a different town in Taiwan. And the hotel was completely booked. There was no place quiet enough for me to play for him except this closed bar in the basement. So I play my Winiowski without the piano accompaniment, the smell of beer. Nothing was ideal. I don't have a, I didn't have a good violin because soon I wasn't going to pursue music. And he rarely saw Asian students who play so much from the heart, you know, because we grew up, a lot of us grew up with tiger moms, practice, practice, practice. But I wasn't practicing for my parents, you know, when, when I became one of 5,000 students at my uh, middle school to have special permission from afternoon nap, we were all required to take a nap, very tropical weather in Taiwan. But I got special permission to practice, and music became mine during that time. And so what I did was, um, uh, well, I just I just play for him as I would normally, and he offered me on the spot scholarship to come study violin in America. And my parents thought, okay, well maybe she will become a concert violinist, as we hope. So I tricked my parents into giving me a ticket to come to America so I can finally learn conducting. So I arrived in um, Boston at, at age 16, not speaking English, not eating salad, you know, Chinese vegetables were all cooked and it's a total culture shock. And yet it changed my life because uh, Mr. Zender at the end of rehearsal will always say, there are five minutes left, who wants to conduct? And I'm dying. I was sitting second violin principal. I was dying to raise my hand, but I was too shy. So my American STEM partner went to Mr. Zander one day and said, Mr. Zander, I just want you to know, Mayan's too shy to raise her hand. So uh, she really wants to conduct. And, you know, I'm blessed with angels like this. It's just incredible, I, you know, that she did that for me. So we were on tour in Spain playing Mahler oh. Five. Uh, about eight cities, and we were on long bus rides, and I bought myself the first conducting score. I mean, given that it's a miniature score, so I can carry it in my bag, and I will take out in the long bus ride to study and then put it back when people can see me because I don't want my friends to ask me, what are you doing with a conductor score? And so 
So the fun part comes, the last sound check in Madrid. You know, we go to a different city, a different venue, and a short sound, sound uh, check. Let, let, me, let, let me say that now you are in Chicago, and I'm in Madrid. So this is the connection. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and that's why I have to tell you this, this story I don't usually share, because it's really fascinating. So at Madrid, the last uh, performance of Mahler 5, and of course it was, you know, shockingly late. I think it was like 11 o'clock at night. You know, we're all uh, excited that, you know, it's, it's going to be the last concert. So um, at the sound check, Mr. Zender walked towards me and mm -hmm. basically said, may I come up here and conduct the first movement of Mahler 5? So that's the first time. <laughs> I conducted a full orchestra, and I was very shy, you know, not many orchestra members knew me, and then afterwards, they all came to me and said, man, I think you really have talent for this, and so it was really, really special to have that, my, my unofficial debut in Spain. Right. Uh, you've mentioned before uh, this thing about the tiger mom. Since you've gone through this experience, for those of you who don't know what, what that means, it means, as you said, practice, 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 and hard. And would you recommend people to be like a tiger mom? Well, that's interesting. You think of him as the ideal uh, example when it comes to the best of education in the West and in the East. So my dear friend, Yo Yo Ma, as an example, he grew up with Chinese parents, but I think he, uh, I think earlier uh, in his, uh, he grew up in, uh, I think Paris and l later on America. And you see someone like him who grew up with parents, probably tiger parents, because, you know, he wasn't allowed to eat un uh, unless he spoke Chinese at home. I mean, it's very strict in terms of, you know, in passing down the heritage the parents felt very important for him. But you can also see him being a successful, you know, in terms of such creative individual. And yet combining with that discipline, um, I, basically, I think the Asian culture is big on discipline. Maybe that's where the tiger moms come from in terms of um uh, really holding the children to discipline. I, and I think I see the best of both worlds. I think we need uh, both because uh, coming from Asia, as you heard, I was afraid to voice my opinion in classroom. It just wasn't something I was encouraged. You follow, you don't necessarily lead. But in America, when I came as a teenager, I was shocked. You know, we are so encouraged to voice opinions in the classroom and in fact if you don't speak the teachers think you don't do your homework and so it's a totally different culture and so i think i would recommend people out there you know the best of both worlds have enough discipline but al allow enough space for your children to be creative and find their own voices right so now you're in we are you're in the states and you start uh, well you had your first an official conducting session in Madrid with the Fifth of Mala. Um, but you start getting really deep into uh, conducting. Uh, who were your, your teachers or the, or the people you learned from? Yes, uh, I call her my American mother because uh, Mary Lou Speaker Churchill, who played second violin principal over 30 years at Boston Symphony, one of the first uh, women principals in America, she took me in like a daughter. She taught me English, speaking so slowly in our lessons, and she taught me how to speak, how, how to eat, how to have balanced diet. So she would require me to eat salad before our violin lessons because she knows I wasn't getting my fiber and I lived with the Churchills for uh, several years and they took in 87 or probably more international students during Mary Lou's lifetime and so I'm really grateful for Mary Lou's approach uh, in life but also in music you know when it comes to a difficult passage Mary Lou will always tell me you've got to love it you, when you love it more, you overcome it better. 
and don't think about it. Uh, I, I have to overcome. I have to overcome. And so it's, it's, a, it's a philosophy in life that I'm so grateful for having someone like Mary Lou to be my first uh, music teacher, but also life teacher in America. And then later, um, I had wonderful teachers at New England Conservatory. It was very unusual because, as you heard, I came to America to be a conductor, but I had to uh, find my way in through violin. And so I had wonderful teachers, uh, violin teachers such as Eric Rosenbliff, who was the uh, student of Car Flush. And so it was very um, incredible for me to get to know this musician that 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 really takes music making, not just on the page, but you know, every lesson, you know, I, I, I will be actually by junior, third year in college, I'm doing half of the week in violin, half of the week in conducting. I was in every conducting class. It was uh, orchestra, wind ensemble, uh, choral, even though there wasn't a degree, I was basically doing both. So I would, you know, get my notes in. I came into my violin lesson and Mr. Rosenbluff was said, well, Maya, you got all the notes. But what are you trying to say? And that always stays with me. You know, music has to say something, has to convey something deeper that the composer is trying to say. And then I uh, also had James Boswell on the violin, on the conducting, my first um, conducting father. I will call him Mr. B, uh, Mr. Frank Battisti, who was very well known in the wind ensemble world in America because he commissioned wide range of new pieces for wind ensemble, making it very important repertoire for wind ensemble, which is a much later um, genre than symphony orchestra. And so Mr. B was so clever. He asked me to put together ensembles for his conducting class in exchange for my conducting lessons. And you know why he did that? Now I'm so grateful because he knew I was very shy. So by asking me to be the orchestra manager, you know, getting on the phone, we, we don't have cell phone back then. I memorized all the phone numbers. So I practiced taking a break. I got on the phone calling the woodwind players, the brass players, the percussionists. You know, the woodwind players, was, was, they were friendly, but they're not in my world. I'm a, I grew up as a violinist. You know, string players is my comfort zone. Now, Brass player, that's, a, that's really outside my comfort zone. Those guys are scary. Mostly, you know, men and mostly boys and big boys. And, you know, I'm, I, my English wasn't so good back then, but, you know, I had to find a way to connect with them. The percussionists, well, they're both scary and funny. So it was, it was a way for Mr. B to say, man, break out of your shyness and because that's what you need. Uh, uh, to be a, a successful conductor. And so I'm so grateful to have Mr. B starting me out in appreciating many pieces I didn't know. Stravinsky Octet. Um, there's so many wonderful pieces in the wind ensemble. And then later leading up to uh, orchestra conducting, I have Richard Hoynik, who was a very well-known bassoonist with the Montreal Symphony before he came to be full-time uh, conductor in Boston. And later on, uh, I, I, I will, since I'm talking about teachers, you know, I'm so grateful to have so many mentors in my life. For example, my, uh, my conducting father, Kent Kiesler, and University of Michigan when I was doing my doctorate, uh, but also uh, Gustav Meyer, who I never really was able to get into his program. He, re he retired from University of Michigan when I tried to get there, and because of visa, I could not switch school. He went to Peabody, but I, I studied with him privately, and, um, and he really impacted my life, uh, also from uh, his conducting class at Tanglewood. You know, I applied for eight times, couldn't get in. Um, they see my name popping up, you know, and they said, well, we see you have a review in the Boston Globe for playing concert master solo in uh, Beethoven's Mrs. Alumnus. So we would like to invite you to play in the conducting class. And, you know, life is, is full of up and downs and, and so many interesting turns that, you know, now I look at life and think that there's always silver lining in everything we go through, even when it's difficult. 
I have to say that um, there are some people watching us now live and it's becoming quite international. This, I guess these are people who know you. We have Mei Shan Lin saying, hey, Mei An. And from uh, somewhere, I, I think maybe it could be Italy, I don't know. How wonderful to see you again. Uh, Gabi Di Lascio. How wonderful to see you yes. again. Yes. Uh, uh, much I love from London. I just got an interview with from London. And we also have yeah. Veronica Babush. So excited to watch you. Hopefully to see we see each other again someday and share a meal. Veronica Bashu, Babush. Basbush. Um, yes. Another, another one. Yasbeta Vivas Iritari. Also is greeting you. She's greeting you. For those of you who are watching now, uh, I just let you know, if you have any questions for May Ann, just feel free to, to write down your questions and if we have the chance, I will ask those questions. Because yeah. uh, uh, for me, as I said, this is a, a, a way for people to discover who you are. Okay, you started, you finished your, your studies and there is a time or when you have to face uh, the orchestra. When I mean the orchestra, is this orchestra that is your your debut and you, you consider is very important. How yeah. was your feeling, and uh, were you afraid? What was the, the the sensations you had the first time you said? So that Mahler Five in Madrid was an eye-opening experience for me. You know, growing up as a violinist, I always hear the melodies. I don't know about others, but you know, we always had the melody and we're not good at counting rests. Give us two measures of rests and we get lost. Um, but w I remember being on the podium and all of a sudden I became like an alien. I have all this antenna. I feel like I'm part of the viola section. Wow, that's amazing. Cello, what wind colors? The brass, the big sound, and the percussion. I feel like I feel like a kid in candy store. Meaning, there's just so many more possibilities than what I have on the violin. Not to say the violin isn't great instrument, it is. But just to have all this different temper and this different colors. And so I think it's really interesting that I started. You mentioned I play trumpet, well, very, very basic level, was because I became, when I was in Taiwan, in that middle school period when I was not really getting a music education other than attending, mm -hmm. you know, orchestra concert with my wonderful mentor, Henry Major, I became very intrigued in other instruments. And I self-taught myself on trumpet. I got enough... Um, I got enough money to buy myself an uh, instrument. And then um, later on, at, when I was a doctor student at University of Michigan, I took as many music education classes when it focused on instruments. I took timpani, for example. I have perfect pitch. We have a, a lot of Asian oh. students uh, have perfect pitch, which is handy when you are playing the timpani because you can tune to the pitch without help you know you can just use your ear and so it's really interesting for me to learn what it takes you know the double re instrument needs a very clear beginning uh flute and clarinet they can sneak in you don't have to always give very clear ectus um brass instrument they also need very clear because the way they have to somehow find the beginning of that sound Percussion, I mean, I get to learn about the psychology behind the sections as well. And so not knowing, not knowing whether I had really have a chance, uh, I was trying to equip myself in learning as, as much as I can in actually playing the instrument and knowing what the, what the, what the challenges are. And I start memorizing music dic dictionary. So I may not know a lot of musical terms in terms of to pronounce it correctly, but I start, I recognize, you know, a lot just because I, I think I was equipping myself to be ready to be a conductor. So I have a comment from uh, Saida Fadal from, uh, she's from Uruguay, but she's in Argentina. I will translate into English because she said it's in Spanish. Uh, yes. I love the joy with with, uh, with with Anne tells these anecdotes. It's a pleasure to listen to. So 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I find very interesting is this thing. Um, when you, you, you've mentioned every section of the orchestra, is, uh, there is a psychology to it. And um, I'd like you to, to tell us about this experience of the orchestra conductor, not really as a conductor, but as a psychologist, because you have to, in the end, you're dealing with people and you are leading. You said you were very shy when you were young. Yeah. However, you're a leader. You've become a leader. And what a leader, I have to, I have to say. You know, it's interesting because if you think about conducting, well, hopefully the audience won't hear us make sound, yeah. but we really help to make the biggest sound in terms of our sound are produced by other artists who have their own creative opinions and, and, and yearning to be mm -hmm. creative. And so how do you pull 80 to 100 people together to have a consensus that, that, is, that captures the, spontaneous, spont, spontaneous, uh, the spontaneous music making, like chamber music? You know, you see chamber music, they look at each other and they may actually perform each piece a little bit differently depending on okay, I'm taking a little time here. Okay, I go with you, but how about here? You let me, t you know. And so how to recreate that in the big symphony orchestra? It's what I always strive for, even when I was growing up, um, uh, coming up with the rank as a young conductor, because I think once you lose that, once you lose the fun of, creating music in the moment, inviting people to feel they're part of it, then it becomes a routine. Or we're just following the beat, whether it's clear. But you know, I think the best compliment when I get conduct around the country is how people remember why they became musicians. I think that's the best compliment to me in terms of I was able to help them feel how fun and how, how involved they are, even in playing in an orchestra. And so I think that, that's really hard to do. Um, in terms of leadership, I would just say that I believe my job, uh, two parts, being a conductor is being the music. Uh, one of my conducting teacher, Richard Hoynick, uh, Mr. Hoynick gave me a book on um, acting, because he said to me, man, well, think about conducting as the highest form of acting, meaningful, that you are trying to convey. So for, for, for me, it, it's years after that I really understand, watching Bernstein, for example. You know, I love Bernstein conducting Haydn Symphony with the Vienna Philharmonic using only his eyebrows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he was living the music. He was trusting them. That's the best example of leadership. When you lead, it's really enable others to also lead with you. And, and so I always try to remember that my job, being a, conduct, being a conductor, being the music, I am the representative for the composer's voice. But at the same time, when it comes to orchestra, that there is this trust factor that I invite you. I invite you to be in this with me. And I think it's hard to do, but so powerful when you feel like you're just, you're flying. You don't have to work so hard to get the car going. The orchestra is going and then take off. That, that's a wonderful feeling. Yeah, I have Gabby Dilasho again. He's saying, and she's a woman conductor. You have to work twice as hard on the psychology, I am guessing. Is that true? Gabby, Gabriella, so nice to have you join us. You know, what a great question. I, I think it's interesting uh, in terms of, I think most orchestra just, they can, they can tell if this conductor's got it in the first three or five minutes. I mean, it doesn't take long. They can, orchestra's a little bit like wolves. 
They smell fear on the podium. You're done. <laughs> and so I think as a woman conductor, what's difficult is that when we want to get things done, for example, I have found uh, in my own experience, when I'm addressing sections that predominantly are, you know, male musicians, we're talking about brass section, percussion section, I have to find a very clever way because it's interesting. Sometimes, you know, it could be an older generation of um, gentlemen in that section. And, you know, I could be their granddaughter's age or daughter's age. So who am I to tell them? how to play their passage better. You, you have to really think about, you know, human history as well. And so I try to find a, a good way to always address something collectively and not individual musicians, but finding interesting examples in my rehearsals. For those of you who have been in my rehearsals, they, they probably always remember, I'm one of the rare co conductors that uses live examples. I will say, well, let's, let's get that last note as dry, sharp as sushi knife. And so, you know, <laughs> and then boom, they got it. They got it. Somehow, you know, they got the sharpness. Or I would say, you know, this patch sounds good, but it's lacking the fire coming out of the wok in Chinese stir fry. Well, their stir fry isn't just Chinese cuisine, but, but you know, they got the picture. And so I try to make the rehearsals more fun when I have to get things done. Uh, instead of being, you know, tough uh, or power, you know, people think of male conductors of being powerful when you're tough. But when it's a woman conductor, then we're called the B word lady. And so I try to see if I can get the music still achieve what I need to achieve. Um, but but with with the with with the process that's acceptable but really enjoyable by everybody. Right. I have to say it's, it's becoming quite international. We have people from, from Argentina, from Mexico as well. I can see, I have my laptop here. Uh, people from San Diego as well, in the United States, in Europe, Central Europe, a lot of people. I, I like that. So I remind you, if you have any questions for May Anne, feel free to ask, because uh, uh, that's what it is about, about discovering May Anne. Yeah. Uh, th then and there's and I wonder... To... Oh, go, yeah, go. so Michael... Michael, I want to say your your coffee series has been very international, but but I also want to mention that it conducting really has brought me to meet people in so many different places and so many different countries I never thought possible growing up in Taiwan. So so hello friends out there. If if you know I'm not mentioning you individually, but thank you so much for for jo for joining us no, on this coffee people... session joining us from different countries. And that's what, that, that was my next topic because you, I mean, currently you are the uh, main conductor in the Chicago Sinfonietta and the conductor laureate in the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. But you've played in so many orchestras around the world, in Asia, in Central Europe, in the United States. Um, my question is, can you tell a difference in the way musicians feel music in Asia in Central Europe and uh, the United States, and how you combine, I mean, how can you adapt to any taste? Great question, Michael. You know, as a conductor, it's, it's interesting for me to be able to, it's a little bit, music is a little bit like cuisine, if I could use it that way. You know, you have, you have different spices uh, when it comes to like Indian food, Chinese food, and and um, you know um, s some specialties uh, in uh, Europe, European different countries, paella in Spain, and and just you know different things. So orchestras are similar in that way. However, I have always found the one common thread is orchestra musicians, just like any artist, they want to always give their best. And so when they have someone on the podium able to inspire them to that, then they, then they enjoy that week. But then, you know, if, if somebody is not able to 
create that kind of chemistry with them, then they they can't create that chemistry on their own. Even though they they can sound like a great ensemble, but they need they they need that somehow that one person to to pull things out of them to let the flavor come through. So in Asia, where I grew up, uh, the the technical level is just amazing. I mean, even from very younger age. Uh, you know, I lead the National Taiwan Symphony Orchestra Summer Pro Summer Festival, which included the International Youth Forum. Our faculty members coming from Europe and America were always stunned. Oh my gosh, these kids, age 14 to 22, they play like professional orchestras, like the end of 10 days. Now, uh, when I go back and work with uh, musicians in Asia, two things that's interesting. One, the technical level is always there. So you don't have to worry about so much of wrong notes or uh, pitch. I mean, it's, it's always there. But is the, is the musicality always the best they can be? Is the orchestra as free as it can be? You really have to work at it. This phrase, going this way. Think about it this way. Really have to encourage them to be outside their, their really, I sound good. You know, I'm doing everything good technically. And then the other really interesting thing, I don't know, I think it's unique in the world. You look over the orchestra, for example, viola, cello, bass, and even some, you know, percussion. It's all ladies. <laughs> it, it's really <laughs> amazing. It's like there's something different here. And, and it took me a while to realize because people in Taiwan, they're afraid their their kids won't have a career in music. But but this incredible um, female dominated um, in in music that that's very unique, I think. Now let me talk about America, maybe Europe. Last, I grew up in the system in America, and Ameri American orchestra is about efficiency. If you can't rehearse efficiently, you're out. They need you to be able to really watch the clock, never go over the time. That's very important. But they really are big on efficiency. Don't talk too much. They, you know, the orchestra know. It's like a pyramid. When you go through the piece, they already know what needs to be worked on, what, what went wrong, and what could be better. But if you don't hit on the points, is it letter D that needs the transition, or is it the intonation, or... If you don't go through the, the trouble spot, they know you can't rehearse. It's, it's very interesting. It's like if you think of Wall Street, it's, it's efficiency of American orchestra. They sound great, and they don't want to waste time in terms of if, if they, there's, a there's a conductor that doesn't know where to rehearse. Now, one thing about American orchestra that's a big difference for me is it's American orchestra's move physically. It's almost we were taught. And and I'm not it's not fair to be making this general general generalization, but but forgive me for this observation. It's almost as if only the principals are allowed to move more. It's part of leading. The other section players should follow. So there is this very interesting mentality when I go to Europe, I feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I wish we could bring that system to you, uh, America more. Because in Europe, in, in most of what I have worked in, the Scandinavian orchestra, I have a position now in Graz in Austria. Uh, I'm making my music a ride with uh, Tun Kusler in November. And what's fascinating to me is that they take so much pride in being an orchestra musician. It's just as important as being quartet. And, and you know, I, I, I was trained the American way, so I'm very efficient, and I usually want to end the rehearsal early. And then I have, like, four hands raised up. Could we go back and do H again? Uh, could we go back and do this? And I'm just done. In America, if you end early, everybody's like, yay! This, per this conductor knows <laughs> his or her stuff. But in Europe, they take so much pride in... Well, uh, could we make this even more perfect or I need it one more time? You know, there's time. That's, that's, that's let the coffee, 
let's let the food simmer a little bit longer. And they're interested in rehearsals. Uh, when you start to rehearse, well, Germany has longer period of rehearsals. And so if you don't know how to put things together, then they're like a little bit like this because they're looking for that, what makes that dish unique. And, and also, I just so enjoy seeing the whole orchestras. They, there's just such a freedom, almost like what I, what I talked about, the, the, the chamber orchestra musicians. And even though they may not be looking across the stage, and sometimes I encourage that, look across your colleagues, and hopefully they like each other, and they always laugh. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting to me that they feel that this is an art form, they're in a family, this is an art form, that they're valued, and they feel pr such pride. And I, I wish that's the case with American orchestras more. Right, and well, we're just speaking about how American orchestras or uh, European orchestras or Asian orchestras are, but what, what about in, well, in terms of sound, is there also a difference between the quality of sound not, I'm not just of course. talking about people, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, I think the strings, it's, it's a little bit more stylish difference, but not a hu huge difference. The huge difference for me comes in the woodwind color. Oboe, for example. The European oboe. So, so I'm so glad you asked, because I go to uh, Asia... Uh, to orchestra in Taiwan, and this is what happens. You have mostly American style strings sound because a lot of them come to study at Juilliard, uh, Peabody, or New England Conservatory. It's a trend. Now, the woman section in Taiwan is European. <laughs> so you have American strings, European woodwinds, and more or less American brass. Which is, I, I think it's so interesting that you have this multicultural inference and, and I, I love it. I love it because it's, uh, it, it's again, making it a little bit different. But I could tell you um, that uh, Europe, you know, it's hard to say it's European style, but the, but the European oboe is, is very, very different. The Vienna horns, uh, the Vienna oboes are also sort of a specialty, you know, and so, I actually love when all the country retain its character. And with COVID, you know, I know everybody, I hope all the listeners out there that you're doing well and safe. Um, and I know it's a difficult time for many of us, you know, to, to have to stay home more, but it, it's got me thinking, this is more like life probably hundred years ago, right? We're not able to, see another thing well we we the good thing is we have internet we still could connect with each other across the globe but imagine that's why i think ravel for example ravel in the 20s along with you know Mio, with many european composers they were fascinated with jazz because it's so american but if you look at it jazz is not really just american because the jazz um the forerunner of jazz was ragtime which came from Africa. And so I love how all the culture uh, influence each other actually through the arts, but with their very distinct flavors, if I could say that. And so, yeah. so now I think in some ways I appreciate, you know, I, uh, I, was a, I was doing programming for the summer festival in Taiwan, and I was going to include Vivaldi for seasons. And the staff there said, well, are you aware of this Taiwanese Four Seasons arranged by a Japanese composer? And that's fascinating to me. It's, it's the different cultures coming together and working, working together and yet keeping your unique flavors. Talking about, uh, uh, you, you mentioned, you've just mentioned a Japanese composer arranging the uh, Vivaldi's uh, Seasons. Uh, I know you work intensively with women composers, and I'd like you to speak about this yes. because I find it very interesting, and later on I will explain to you why. Well, you know, 
I never really grew up thinking women conductors are minority. I mean, I knew that, but it, it wasn't going to stop me because you know, if it was going to stop me, I would have given up long ago. But I just, I just somehow feel that if, if it's possible for me, that it's possible for others. So. The thought of championing for woman composer actually came much later because you know, as a young conductor, you say yes to all the composers' requests. That's how you can have opportunities to to conduct something. Um, and so the the thought to champion for woman composer really came when I became music director for Chicago Symphony. The baton passing concert from our beloved founder Maestro Paul Freeman to me was an entire concert featuring works by women composers as his way of saying, because Chicago Sinfonietta is uh, well known for championing for minority musicians. So if you think of African-American musicians, Latino musicians, that's very easily associated with minority group. But if you look at the world, the one one of the most neglected group of minority compose, uh, minority musicians are women composers. Two years ago in America, less than 2% of works, of entire works in America was, was by women. And so um, during the 30th anniversary for Chicago Sinfonietta, that was two years, two seasons ago, uh, it's a conversation that surfaced out of, you know, our musicians, our staff, our, our uh, volunteer, that we should do something to to, to make it sort of a big statement. And the thought of championing for nine women composers when our entire season only have 20 works, we have only five major concerts. And we thought we're gonna blow that 2% out of the water. Nine out of 20, that's almost half. And so we were, we, we commissioned several and we actually captured several in uh, what I so proud to 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 say that SETI that's, records that is, are that's wonderful. Exactly. Project W, and so let me talk about the woman composers. Florence Price yes, be, became the first African American woman composer in the country when Chicago Symphony premiered her symphony in E minor in 1933. I mean, this is in the 30s. That's incredible. So. Uh, I have found, you know, many orchestras, they would not let you program an unknown composer for 45 minutes long. So I look around because Chicago Symphony was inviting me to make my subscription debut with Florence Price music. So I start researching a lot of her piece and I found a short piece called Dances and the King Breaks. Um, at, wrote for piano at the end of her life. She, was able to orchestrate for her on her own, but she had a stroke. So her childhood friend, William Grant, still orchestrated for orchestra. And I thought maybe people would use this as an entryway into Florence Wright's music. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Clarice Assad, the daughter of the Assad brothers from Brazil. Um, you know, Clarice will study in Chicago, but have travel, you know, from, South America, North America. So she wrote a piece, sort of a travel log through the Americas, combining the different uh, idioms. Jesse Montgomery, who is a, a, a mm -hmm. wonderful, probably the most unique uh, African-American woman composers on, uh, on the scene right now. She was a New York Phil, part of the Project 19. I was involved in the Project 19. Mm -hmm. Uh, until New York Phil had to cancel. Um, but incredible sense of t taking, you know, from jazz, from popular music idioms and forging into something. She lived in New York City, so she is hearing that influence all the time. Now, Rena Esmel, I love Rena because yes. I can't find another composer who is able to combine the traditional hin Hindu musical tradition, which is very different. It's an oral tradition. There's no notation. You have the rhythm, something like that. Uh, but the ragas, which is the melodic 
Um, yes. And she takes the, the hin, hin, uh, Hindu traditional music and morph it to, to be with the perfect combination with Western music. And so uh, Rina had wrote us a piece at the time, a different title. It was with the YouTube, Me Too movement. So Rina emailed us and said, could I change my piece to Me Too because of her own personal experience? And we were so supportive. We said, go for it. So it's a, on the CD, you will hear Rina singing the ragas that make up yes. the piece of Me Too, which is so incredible. You feel like you're transported to a different world when you hear Rina singing the ragas um, in, on this recording. Jennifer Higdon, one of my dearest friends, I befriended her uh, when I was assistant conductor with the Atlanta Symphony. I assisted her in the singing room featuring Atlanta Symphony, Atlanta Symphony Chorus, Jennifer Cole on the violin. Incredible piece. And Jennifer has been such a generous friend and allowing us to be the co-commission of her new work called Dance Car. Each movement is a different dance. And I just love Jennifer because she has such a unique sound. When I rehearsed the orchestra, I said, this is not just any 16 notes or eighth note. This is Je Jennifer Higdon eighth note, which has a different energy. And I just love that she has such a, she has carved out such an a incredible career to show that women can go as far. Right. Uh, this is the, the, the CD I have. Uh, when I listen to it, it's, uh, I was amazed. And uh, uh, I researched on Rina, Rina Ismail, and I loved her music. So maybe I have the chance someday to have a coffee with her. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Was, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will. I promise. I'll, 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 I'll try to, to get in touch with her somehow. Uh, you, one of your sentences I read on the internet talking about Batund, about leading, conducting, is different pieces need different kinds of batons because you are a baton collector. Well, I used to be, but now I really think baton is just um, an extension of the hand. I can conduct without baton. So I can, I can tell you a, f a funny story. You know, the first time I was making debut with Nephilim's Philharmonic at the Concertgebouw, with Bate Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. It's a big deal to me. Um, and then after the, there were two performances, Saturday night, Sunday, after the Saturday night, you know, in, in Amsterdam, you take the streetcar. You know, everybody takes a streetcar, it's just easier. I was talking about balance for the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto with my manager, and we were so into our conversation. I left my bag, my conducting bag on the tram, um, I couldn't find it, you know, it's gone. And so I called the orchestra um, uh, staff. I said, I don't need, I don't need music, uh, but you know, the, the concerto is nice to have just in case if there's any accident, um, then we, have, you know, it's nice to have that. And so the next day before the matinee performance, half an hour before the wonderful principal clarinist uh, in the orchestra came in knock on the door. And he said, the orchestra heard about my misfortune of losing my bag. So here's the baton. He noticed the baton I use. He said, here's the baton on behalf of the orchestra for you to keep. And um, because, you know, I was going to go in and conduct without the baton. I couldn't make it work. You know, I can, because of years of observing people, if you give me two minutes, I can imitate any conductor. Really, it's, it's, a, it's a, fun hobby of, a fun hobby of me. And so anyway, so now I have baton. I have other stories. Um, I'm, it, it, the good part, I have batons from Netherlands, Sweden, and different parts as memento of my wonderful trips there. And so I, now I collect batons, not because it's... Um, different batons for different conductors, but it's, it's batons from different orchestras that have meant different things. So thank you. Right. Um, we have a limited time and, and we have three sections on this that are always the same. One of them is on books. 
if we uh, and I feel I feel sorry because you are so enthusiastic and full of energy that I would be speaking with you for hours and hours and I can tell musicians who work with you must be really uh, proud of you because you, you really transmit to you that energy and I find I find it fantastic um, what books would you recommend you know from some of our project uh, Tony Morrison was going to be part of the project's focus so I became very fascinated with this um, African-American woman author that won the Nobel Prize and for the longest time um, couldn't get recognition in America because of her race. And I've fallen in love with her writing. And I'm, since I have the time, I'm going from the beginning. And her first book from 1970s, it's called The Bluest Eye. And so it's really talking about how, I mean, her writing is just, it, 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 it's so engaging. Sometimes it's painful, but you don't want to put it down. It's just that kind, and, and she has such a humanity, humanity in her writing. I mean, you can tell that she writes, uh, she wrote from the place of love. So even the book ha has many difficult subjects um, that's covered. So it's really systematic uh, racism, how that impacts a young black girl growing up. And the only thing that she really, really want God to answer was to give her blue eyes. I mean, it's just to think about that she didn't think God answer her prayers because her eyes didn't turn blue. I mean, it's just incredibly powerful, but, but I will highly recommend any work by Toni Morrison uh, for our readers out there. The Bluest Eye may be a great place to start. And also, I am proud, so proud to share that one of our cellists in the Chicago Sinfonietta uh, became New York Times bestseller uh, several years ago. And his, his name is Edward uh, Kelsey Moore who is a wonderful cellist, but, her, uh, but his book, it's called The Supremes. He has written two Supreme series. The first one, The Supremes at Earl's All You Can Eat. And the second one, The Supremes Sing the Happy Heartache Blues. Really centers around three women's close friendships and inspired from his own relatives, his own family, how the women had this very close, you know, love and struggle in life and how they help each other out through ups and downs of life. It's just incredible, incredible novel that I highly recommend people to, mm -hmm. to read. Again, Edward Kelsey Moore. I have to say, Joel Frederickson is watching us as well. Hi, Frederick, because he said, nice interview. So, Joel Frederickson, watching us, you're welcome. Uh, we've, we've spoken about books, and now, this is tough, but if you would have to recommend a recording, something you have to listen once in a lifetime, please. Yes. I would like to recommend another woman composer that was part of the Night Composer We Champion uh, two years ago, and I was honored that I brought probably the U.S. premiere of this incredible work since it was, it, it, since it was premiered 100 years ago. Her name is Dora Pejecevic. Um, if you look up the first symphonic composer in Croatia, her name will pop up. And I would highly recommend uh, listening to her symphony in F sharp minor. Let me see if I can turn the camera around. Um, can you see that? Yes. Dora Pejacevic, yeah. Symphony in F sharp minor. Let me, let me get to this page so you can see. The, there's only one recording. Oh, shoot. Um, this, this is the next recording I was going to recommend. So I, would, I, I totally recommend Dora 
Pejacevic, because you hear a glimpse of Bruckner, of Strauss. I think she studied with Strauss' teacher. Incredibly powerful music. Last movement, it was Wagnerian. She wanted six horns, four trumpets. I mean, just out of this world in terms of, mm -hmm. um, this is the only recording that I'm, uh, that I'm a, a aware of. The other piece, I am so in love, uh, the composer, Piazzolla. This is an interesting so one. Yes, it's an interesting one. If, if, you, uh, if people don't know classical music, this is the A seasons. It has the four seasons of Vivaldi pairing with Piazzolla's four seasons of Buenos Aires. And this is an arrangement. This is by Gideon Kramer's recording. I, I just thought you hit both, both composers in terms of, you know, Piazzolla's tango. I just, I, I can't get enough of it. It's just so lovely, uh, the composer from Argentina, but, but really has sort of the Spanish uh, lineage in terms of the influence. And so yeah. I highly recommend these two recordings. Thank you. And last, but not least, uh, let's become a bit transcendental. Um, uh, one of the sections is if you would have a message for someone who would be watching us in a hundred years time, so none of us will be here. Well, maybe science makes us <laughs> be there, but that's quite un uh, unlikely. Uh, what kind of message would you have for that person that is watching you now, a lady from the beginning of the 21st century, someone from the 22nd century? I would say, be simple be human, and be kind. I think, you know, life doesn't have to get complicated. I know we, we had invented so many wonderful things, but I think deep down, um, deep down, I think this world, uh, the, the COVID really makes me learn a lesson that we don't really need a whole lot to survive on. And it's important to take time to focus on those things which makes us human, which is um, take care of each other, be kind to each other, and take care of our earth. So this earth can continue for hundreds and thousands of years to go. So, um, Mayan, it's been a real, real pleasure talking to you. Uh, we've been uh, over an hour now. It's, I'm I'm sad that we have to cut this conversation because I, there are a lot of things I would like to speak about with you. When you mentioned you had a perfect pitch, I would have I'd like to speak about that too. And but I'm really happy because I know because of what I've seen while we were speaking that people who usually don't listen to um, symphonic music uh, got the idea that you are an enthusiastic person, passionate, full of energy, and above all, and most important, that you can really get that message across. I, I can't tell because it was a pleasure talking to you. I, 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 needed, I didn't need to, 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 <laughs> to ask any questions because it's, it was so, so nice. I'm really happy. And I hope, I really do hope that someday we will meet in person and, and have a chat. Well, thank you so much for having me here, Michael, and, and I applaud for everything you're doing to engage people through the arts. I think you guys are the heroes of keeping the arts going, and I'm so honored to be your guest and, and look forward to meeting you uh, someday, you know, the music world is very small, and yes. so I have no doubt, I'm sure, I'm sure, I have no doubt. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll meet someday, I can't tell. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Cecia. Uh, gracias. Ciao. Bye.